Lithuania's experience is in many ways inspiring to Americans and inspiring to me. And the events of the of 1990, actually leading up to 1990 and after, afterwards. You are listening to Talking Diplomacy. This is a podcast about diplomacy and international relations brought to you by the Lithuanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In this episode, we introduce the United States Ambassador to Lithuania, His Excellency Mr. Robert Gilchrist. Thank you for coming. It's great to be here. Ambassador, the beginning of your time was marked by the extraordinary situation, the spread of coronavirus and new ways of working, communicating and living. How did it change your work and life in Lithuania, where you recently moved? Well, it certainly changed my life very quickly. I I had been here for a month. I had to go back to Washington and for a quick trip through Germany and then came back when we had the B9 summit. And my boss, the the acting assistant secretary for Europe, was here. So we had a lot going on. And as soon as he left town, it became apparent pretty quickly um, that things were changing and that we were going to need to take action. I think the Friday, maybe the Friday, the was it the twelfth or the thirteenth? We um, we were planning to basically ramp down the embassy to have about half of our staff there. But then through the weekend, it became pretty apparent that we were going to need to shut down. Um, so I had to to manage our staff of about 200 people. We had to make a lot of phone calls and literally tell everybody to stay home. And then I think in the ensuing weeks, just like many people in Lithuania, we had to figure out um, how to work. Um, the first few weeks were a bit of a challenge. We were still doing a lot by telephone. But pretty soon we learned that there was a lot of stuff that we actually could do remotely and do online. And then... I'd say by the end of the, the quarantine period, we were getting pretty good at, at having meetings online. I was meeting with lots of ministers online, including the foreign minister. And um, I think we learned how to telework. Um, I think prior to that, we talked about it conceptually. Um, but, um, but this health crisis literally um, put us in a situation where we needed to telework. And I think we did it fairly effectively. But everybody was – we were hungry to see other people too. You know, after a few weeks, a lot of staff were eager to get back to work. In many ways, I think even increased camaraderie at the at the embassy um, because we appreciate each other so much more now. I mean, that's how it literally affected our work. I think in terms of of you know U.S. foreign policy, um, you know there there were there have been changes and there there will be changes as a result of of this health crisis. So, but it's been um, it's been an interesting period. I learned a lot about the inside of my house. Um, when I got bored, I simply moved my office to another room and learned a lot about my back garden. I learned if I walked around it 40 times, I could get in 10,000 steps. So um, there are things like that that I learned that I wasn't expecting to. It's made um, the returning to normal, quote unquote, all that much sweeter, I think, for all of us. Unfortunately, there were fewer opportunities to travel in Lithuania. Yeah, I wasn't able to get out, obviously, and so I've um, done my best um, to make up for lost time. So I've already been to to Klaipeda a few times and to Kaunas a few times um, and a few other places, and I'm planning to, to travel out a lot more. Um, I, I also, I went a few times to Pabrade to see the American troops who were there, um, to say goodbye to them when they left a few weeks ago. So I've traveled some, and I'm planning to get out a lot more and, and to meet Lithuanians everywhere. Do you think there will be long-term changes to diplomacy in the post-COVID world? Um, I think there will be, certainly in terms of, of many of the issues that we discuss. I think global, global health was already sort of on the plate. It was something that we all discussed. And, and there, were, there were previous epidemics, I think, that, that, that scared us early on. Um, Ebola is still out there. Um, SARS, when, when, when we had that, that crisis several years ago. And so these were always points for discussion. But I think um, going through this, we realized um, that global health is something that we all have to be concerned about in a, in, a, in a very real way. And I would anticipate just as throughout my career, I've seen new issues sort of rise up and, and really um, become um, serious points of discussion among countries. I would anticipate that, that global health and pandemics are going to be front burner issues from here on out. On 23rd of July, we commemorate the special occasion the anniversary of the Sumner Wells Declaration, a document which condemned the Baltic states' occupation. Why Acting Secretary of the State Sumner Wells decided to announce this declaration and what was its significance? 
Um, well, it was in response to the significant loss of American lives in World War I, and the U.S. had pursued an isolationist foreign policy um, throughout the 1920s and 30s, and we didn't want to be drawn into any more European conflicts. However, when Japan invaded Manchuria in 1931, the U.S. criticized that action in what became known as the Stimson Doctrine, which said that we couldn't recognize states um, that, had, that had been created by acts of aggression. That doctrine actually influenced the Wells Declaration. Um, President Franklin Roosevelt um, wanted the State Department, my institution, um, to begin issuing stronger statements um, at, towards the end of the 30s to test the, the public mood regarding whether or not we should move away from um, isolationism. And there was a lot of concern about events in Europe in the summer of 1940. And amongst some U.S. diplomats, um, particular concern about the Soviet invasion and ultimatums towards the Baltic countries. And on the morning of July 23rd, 1940, um, Sumner Wells asked Loy Henderson, the director of our Office of Eurasian Affairs at the time, to draft a press release condemning the Soviet action and expressing support for the people of Estonia, Latvia, and of course, Lithuania. Sumner Wells thought that um, Henderson's original draft um, didn't go far enough. He said it wasn't strong enough. So he, he himself called President Roosevelt on the phone and got his agreement that Wells could make the declaration even stronger. And the declaration was released later that day. The declaration itself is only seven sentences long, but it is still seen as one of the most principled moments in American diplomacy. And it's certainly a moment I'm very proud of. Um, at the time, the New York Times actually called it one of the most exceptional diplomatic documents issued by the Department of State in many years. And it, it was the cornerstone of our Soviet policy for 50 years. Um, it allowed Baltic diplomatic uh, missions to continue to operate. Um, and when you, talk, uh, when you walk into the State Department in Washington, you see a lot of flags in the entry lobby. And the Estonian, Latvian, and Lithuanian flags continued to fly there throughout the Cold War period and throughout um, illegal Soviet occupation. And U.S. official maps also noted that the U.S. government did not recognize the incorporation of the Baltic states into the Soviet Union for all that time. And this declaration is still very relevant today. Um, and when Secretary of State Pompeo speaks about how we will never recognize Russia's purported annexation of Crimea, he often refers back to the Wells Declaration. Um, it is the basis of our continuous refusal to recognize the Kremlin's claim of sovereignty over territory um, seized by force in contravention of international law. So it's a very important document, obviously, for the people of Lithuania. Um, it's an important document for me as a diplomat and one who firmly believes in an American diplomacy grounded in values. And obviously, it's an important one, I think, for America's engagement in the world in terms of the precedent it set, it set and the, the message it sent globally. It will be interesting to learn more about Sam Wells. Could you tell us more about his other achievements and legacy? Wells, I think, is a very interesting and inspiring figure, but he's also complicated. And um, he came into the U.S. Foreign Service at the encouragement of um, Franklin Roosevelt. So he was directly connected with the Roosevelt family. Um, but it was also a time when the American diplomatic service was, as we said, um, male, pale, and Yale, linked to patrician Northeastern families. Really only new diplomats who came in from the Northeastern universities. He didn't go to Yale. He went to Harvard. Um, um, but he was from a very well-connected family. Um, and a very wealthy family as well. But that would have been typical, quite honestly, of American diplomats at that time. He was initially a specialist in Latin America, but he briefly resigned in 1922 um, because he disagreed with our policy that our, that our military should protect U.S. business interests overseas. And if you look a lot of, uh, about the history of the United States and Latin America, you'll see that a lot, a lot of it was dominated historically by business interest. Um, but he returned the next year um, but then he was fired by President Coolidge, Calvin Coolidge, in 1925 um, because he had married a woman who had recently divorced a friend of President Coolidge. But then um, Franklin Roosevelt, his old friend, brought him back in 1933 and made him the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs. So he was in charge of all of our policy for Latin America. And he served as a special envoy to Cuba. 
And then uh, in 1937, Franklin Roosevelt appointed him Under Secretary of State, which is one of the most senior positions in the State Department. So he was effectively the number three, although someone argued the number two. Um, that was on paper, but in reality, he had a tremendous amount of influence with Franklin Roosevelt, his old friend. Um, and some even saw him as Franklin Roosevelt's sort of plant, his mole over in the State Department. He served there, obviously, at a, an important an interesting and challenging time in American diplomacy as we entered into World War II. He served very augustly. He was very influential in the, the early workings to set up the United Nations. Um, still very engaged in Latin America. But I'll have to say that in 1943, he actually resigned from the State Department. It was because he became involved in what was seen as a scandal in the time that basically revealed his sexual orientation. Um, and at that time, one couldn't be bisexual or gay in the Foreign Service, in the State Department. And so um, he stepped down for fear that the scandal will become even more blown up and problematic for him. Um, so that ended his career in traditional diplomacy. Um, he, was, he continued to be engaged in various sort of fora um, as, as a public figure. Um, but after 1943, um, he, he was no longer an actual diplomat. And it is a very tragic because many had assumed that he would become the, 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 the Secretary of State after Cordell Hull, who was the Secretary of State at the time, would step down. But that, that didn't happen. This also proves that we as society came a long way in terms of tolerance. It did. It did. I mean, uh, that's um, something that I worked on in the State Department was was issues with regard to, to tolerance and um, uh, related to LGBT people. And up until actually the late 80s um, at our Department of State, um, um, one could risk losing your career because of, of sexual orientation. So we have come a long way. We have come a very long way. Let's talk about the U.S. and Lithuania relations. The U.S. has consistently supported the Lithuanian struggle for freedom during the Cold War as well. Why it was part of the U.S. foreign policy to support the countries behind the Iron Curtain? You have already mentioned some of the reasons. Well, I, I, uh, there, there are several reasons. I like to think that the, the primary reason is because U.S. foreign policy remains grounded in our values and our democratic values. And we recognized the reality of the Soviet Union, what it was in terms of the self-determination of, 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 of individuals. Um, also, we recognized the horrific atrocities under Stalin, uh, not just Stalin, but in the periods succeeding that as well. So really, um, our, our foreign policy remained grounded in our values, um, which is what certainly has motivated me as a diplomat throughout my career, and I think many, other, many others in the Foreign Service as well. At the same time, the Soviet Union, as a nuclear power, um, or soon to be nuclear power, uh, right after World War II, you know, was a was a physical threat, an actual threat to the United States as well. Um, and I think everyone knows it's not just Sumner Wells, but there are many other diplomats who really formed the foundation of the Cold War and our containment policy. And um, so, it again, I think it was grounded in our grounded in our, our fundamental values as well as the, the way that we thought we needed to counter the Soviet Union. The links between Lithuania and the US are numerous. We can think of people, companies, cooperation in security and technology. What do you see as the most special element of the friendship between the US and Lithuania? I hate to get back to it, but I'm going to get back to values again. <laughs> NATO, I think many mistakenly see NATO as simply a security alliance, but it's a security alliance that's fundamentally grounded in our democratic values. Um, it's like-minded countries um, who've come together um, and committed to mutual defense. And so first and foremost, it's that. When I've spoken to a number of Lithuanians, I've um, said that Lithuania's experience is in many ways inspiring to Americans and inspiring to me. And the events of the of 1990, actually leading up to 1990 and afterwards, the people who sacrificed so much for the independence of their country, it reminds us in the United States of, of what our democracy is about. And I think it's very inspiring to us as well. But more broadly, I think it means that we work together well um, because we have very similar values. So first and foremost, I see that. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I, there's a tremendous amount of potential in Lithuania in so many ways. And certainly before this COVID crisis, 
um, the Lithuanian economy was gaining uh, quite a bit of steam again. And people began talking about um, the Baltic Tigers again with Lithuania really in a leadership position on that. And so I think there's a tremendous amount of, of, of uh, that we can do um, in terms of our, of our economic relationship. Um, and then there's a lot that we can continue to do to project our values in this region and around the world. Since you mentioned NATO, could you share your insights on how do you see the future of the alliance? As you said, it's not only military cooperation, but there's a lot more to it. Well, I'd, I, I'd say that the, the alliance is strong and robust. Um, you know, sometimes there are contentious conversations at NATO summits, um, but at the same time, what I've seen really across the board is a commitment in Washington um, to a strong and stable NATO. Um, recognizing the importance of this organization of like-minded democracies in ensuring security in this region um, and, quite honestly, beyond. NATO has evolved in many ways over the decades. Um, and, for instance, we look at NATO engagement in Afghanistan, which was the first time that Article 5 um, was actually invoked. Um, but um, America's allies stood with us in Afghanistan and, and remained there for a decade or two. Um, um, but NATO has um, assumed, I think, some responsibilities with regard to, to counterterrorism. Um, NATO hasn't lost track of, of um, our strong commitment to, to security in this region um, with regard to Russia, um, to, to say it bluntly. But at the same time, NATO is looking at new threats such as – or potential threats such as China and what that might, might pose. Um, and so it, it is evolving. And there have been meetings over the past few months um, with regard to COVID and how the alliance works together in response to, to global pandemics. So it's evolving over time and it is a very organic institution. Um, I think that's part of what's kept it strong um, and what's kept it relevant. Um, so I would anticipate more conversations on pandemics um, as well as steps by NATO to ensure that the alliance is better prepared in those situations. Um, continued focus on this region, um, but also um, recognition of, of other potential threats to our security in all sorts of ways. You have previously served in Estonia and Sweden and served as a director of the State Department's Office of Nordic and Baltic Affairs and spent a large part of your career focusing on specific region. It will be extremely interesting to hear what captured your interest in this region and what changes have you observed during those years. Well, I'd like to say it's a great group of countries. Um, we have strong NATO allies. Um, and even those countries that aren't in NATO, um, Finland and Sweden, um, are very focused on the transatlantic relationship um, and work with us on our common goals in lots of different ways. So it's a very friendly region in, the, in that regard and an interesting one. Um, the, it's been fascinating to see the Baltic states evolve over the past 13 or 14 years. Um, when I first began working on this region, it was at the beginning of the 2007 um, financial crisis. And we were worried. I'm sure that everybody was worried too. It was a big hit um, for, for, for these three small countries in the Baltic region. Um, but it's been tremendous to see um, how pragmatic Lithuanians and Latvians and Estonians are and have been and how they responded in a manner that I think has ultimately made um, the economies in this region much stronger. Um, so that's been fascinating. Um, when I first worked on this region, there were lots of concerns about energy security as well. It didn't seem like there was any kind of easy solution, and I certainly wouldn't have anticipated that Lithuania at this point um, would be as far along as it is in being um, independent um, with regard to its, its energy and, and where it obtains energy from. And we were very concerned about it because we recognized the temptations by some neighbors to use energy as a negative diplomatic tool. And we saw that as a vulnerability in this region. And so it was and remains a priority for us. But what's been great to see is how it's been a priority also for peoples in the Baltic and how, um, and how you found solutions. I had the chance to um, 
a few weeks ago in Klaipeda during my first trip to Klaipeda um, to see the LNG terminal. And it was fantastic to see that. And I remember when when the Lithuanian government made the decision to, to move forward with that. And it was impressive to see how quickly it was put together and pulled up and literally began operation. And so for me, um, it was it was great to, to see that. Um, but it's also, um, I think, wonderful to have conversations with with Lithuanian ministers about the steps that continue to be taken to ensure energy energy independence. So, um, so that's something that I've seen evolve over time. Um, and and Lithuania and the other Baltic states, you know, continue to grow economically and really become solidly integrated into into Europe and the EU and into the into the Western club. So it's been amazing to see. Since you worked in Estonia, you know some Estonian language. Is that true? And what does it mean? I speak Estonian. Could you say that knowing some local language gives you extra insight into the culture? It does help a lot um, because you learn a lot, um, not just about the grammar. And in Estonian, I can say that that grammar was tough. It was torture. It was torture trying to learn Estonian. But you develop insight into societies and, and how people think. Are you planning on learning some Lithuanian as well? I didn't have the opportunity to study Lithuanian. Unfortunately, um, the U.S. State Department has has amazing language programs for everybody except for ambassadors. And the reason for that is um, that once we're announced and we ideally get pushed through the Senate, they want to get us out here as soon as possible. And so, so language isn't a part of what we do before we come, although I managed to get three weeks so I got a bit, I got a bit, but I'm afraid it wasn't enough to say that I speak Lithuanian. And I'll continue trying. I promise I will try. I can't promise I'm going to learn Lithuanian fluently, um, but I can promise you I'll try. We wish you success in this endeavor. The last question is, did you find any curiosity about Lithuania that surprised you? Anything that surprised me? Well, I traveled here before, and, I, and I've worked on this region for a while. I'm not going to say I'm surprised by it, but I was pleased just with how warm people have been. And, um, and, and I've spent a lot of time in the Baltic region. Um, I'm not going to talk badly about other Baltic peoples, um, but, um, but I would say that Lithuania really is the Italy of the Baltic. People have been incredibly warm and open to me, and it's, it's been really... Um, a wonderful experience. And I look forward, I'll be here for a while longer at the very least, for, hopefully for a few more years. So I look forward really to discovering this country even more. Thank you so much for coming and for sharing your insights. We wish you a productive and inspiring time in Lithuania. Thanks so much. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for future episodes and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and Flickr. Thank you.